Welcome to the next episode of the Saddle Podcast, the Sitcom Archive Deep Dive Overdrive. My name's Alison Barton Simmons. Now then, I'm Eggs Benedict. How are you doing, Ben? I'm all right. My voice sounds a bit like I'm not, doesn't it? My voice sounds a bit coldy, but I'm all right. Oh, are you all right? Do you, do you need a cough drop or anything? Yeah. Uh, oh, I could murder a tune. We don't have them here. <laughs> oh, I'd love a tune. <laughs> but it's not to be. Well, that is a shame. But, however, we are at the third episode of the 1980s series of Dear John. We are. And it's called, possibly, well, it, Ralph's Curse, is it? It's, it's, I can only find it called Death when I've looked, but it has got two names, apparently. I prefer Ralph's Curse. I think we should just refer to it as Ralph's Curse. Death's a bit... Ralph's Curse. I mean, I know it's, I know it's a little bit of a... Final, isn't it? It's very final. Yeah, I know Dear John's a little bit of a bittersweet, de- no, slightly depressing sitcom, but Death is a bit, yeah, for sitcoms. So let's call it Ralph's Curse. Absolutely, Ralph's Curse. So this episode was shown on the 3rd of March, 1986, on the BBC, originally. Mm -hmm. And I I really enjoyed this episode, and it was quite a a concise episode, I thought. There wasn't much scene shifting, we weren't all over the place. It was was literally moving just from a a club setting at the beginning to Ralph's flat. And that's it, really, isn't it? That's all we see. That's it. I think this is the only one in series one that doesn't feature the one-to-one club, actually. That's true. It doesn't. The rest of them have all got the one-to-one club in. There is 13.06 million viewers for this. Also, see, that's quite high still, isn't it? Even for the um, mid-80s. Yeah, but some reports I read say that the show was cancelled due to disappointing viewer figures. So perhaps in the days of terrestrial, terrestrial TV, primetime BBC One, that was disappointing. I don't know. Oh. In the 80s. Mm. Not, sounds a lot to me, but I don't know. Because that's what led, of course, John Sullivan to sell the format to America in the end, because the BBC were lukewarm on it. Yeah, or it did better, didn't it? Because there was, there was extra series created um, for a different audience. On the subject of the American Dear John, yes. do you know that Kirk, in the American Dear John, turned out to be a spy? He wasn't bullshitting. <gasps> really? Yeah, he was genuinely a spy for the CIA oh, or something wow. like that. Yeah, typical bombastic American approach, isn't it? Of course it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I thought it was a great episode as well, so I'm with you. You will enjoy it. You will enjoy it. As always, we'll be sharing a link to the original video, so you can watch it on Daily Motion, and we embed it in our episode notes page. So if you want to watch that first before listening to us, you know where to find us, sado.club. And then you can join us for the deep dive, and we'll literally take you through the episode minute by minute and discuss everything in great detail from the acting, the costumes, the sets. The misery. The music, the the misery, yes, the sadness, the the tears. The curse. We'll take you through it all. But before we do this week, I think it's high time, don't you, that Brucey made a comeback. Oh, is it time for for a quiz? (laughs) It's time for Brucey's comeback. (laughs) (laughs) So it's Brucey's higher or lower, which is just a basic format ripped off from Play Your Cards Right without any cards. That's okay. <laughs> that makes sense, doesn't it? It does. Uh, when we did this for our first series for The Good Life, we used IMDb information and it was higher or lower, like who's got more credits yes. as an actor and stuff like that. I've mixed it up a bit this time. Oh, right. But it's it's sort of Dear John related, but it's mainly to do with the with the start of Dear John. Okay? Yes. You ready? Are you ready? Are you ready, my love? <laughs> for question number one. I'm ready. Okay. And what do points make? Prizes. Nothing. <laughs> I've got nothing for you. So here's question one. <laughs> As everyone knows, 2005's Juice Bigelow European Gigolo featured Jean Chalice as pro-American woman. <laughs> <laughs> right. We all know that, don't we? Yes. 
this movie has an IMDb score of just 4.7. All right. So I haven't watched it. It cost $22 million to make. Yeah. But did it take higher or lower at the box office than it cost to make? Are you going to go higher or lower? I think I'm going to go higher. You saying higher or lower? I am. <laughs> did she do well? Yeah. Well, that was a bit camp. <laughs> Lucy wasn't camp like that, was he? <laughs> Yes, the answer was it took $45 million, Brilliant. no doubt, because of Jean's take as a pro-American woman. Of course it was. Stealing the show. Oh, right, my love. Let's have a look at the next one. I think I'm going to say you need three out of four to win this. Okay. Okay? And you're off to a good start. Peter Blake. Yes. Kirk St. Moritz. Yes. His last ever film role was a cameo in Run For Your Wife. The calamitous movie we've previously discussed before. Yeah. And it's best forgotten. Now, this movie was made on a modest budget by movie standards. It cost less than a million. It was only about 900000 to make. Sorry for interrupting there. Sorry, Bruce. <laughs> Apparently, it was 900000 to make. And you can tell when you're watching it. Right. And what happened was all of these cameos, you know, bloody Prunella Scales, Richard Bryars. Yeah. Oh, God, who else was in it? Cliff Richard, Rolf Harris. Tons and tons and tons of cameos. Denise uh, Van Outen. Andrew Sachs. Denise Van Outen in it. Yeah, but she was a main actress, not a cameo. She's not like sitcom royalty, okay. is she? Right. I'm just just thinking about. She was one of the main. She, she was, was one, one of the, the main, wives. Ca- main. The main cast where she brought. Okay. Thingy Harding. Sarah Harding was yeah. the other wife. Yeah. To Danny Dyer. Uh, and now all of these all of these cameos they made their appearances for free because the money went to some charity or another. Oh, I can't okay. Remember what. So that's why. That was the only real appeal of it, to see all of these classic, you know... I think Vicky Michelle might have produced this movie. Okay. Or been involved in it in some way. Now, it only cost 900000 to make. So were the box office takings in the UK for this movie... No, <laughs> yeah. Lower. It's, it, it's got to be higher, surely. Got to be higher than 900000 Yeah. Wouldn't that shame? You got it wrong. Really? Oh, my God. Famously, <gasps> in the first two weeks, box office takings were £747. Oh, no. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awful, yeah. isn't it? Because everyone was saying it was the worst movie. All the reviews said this movie's shocking. So Don't nobody bother. went to see it. Right, okay. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh, no. Never mind. One out of two. Okay. It's all right. Yep. Question three. Belinda Lang, the lovely Belinda Lang. Yeah. She was the star of 90s sitcom staple, 2.4 Children. Yes. Ran for several series on BBC in the 90s. And there's, in fact, a podcast which deep dives every episode from our friends at Don't Slam Your Podcast. So check that out. We'll we'll never deep dive that because they've already done it. In fact, the world of deep diving sitcoms is becoming a lot more narrower because everyone seems to be (laughs) doing it. Where are we going to go next? (laughs) I know, yeah, we might run out of shows. But check out that podcast if you're into 2.4 Children because it's very good. The viewing figure for the finale of 2.4 Children right. on BBC was just over 9 million people oh, right. when it aired okay. on December the 30th, 1999. The finale for Dear John, in which Belinda Lang's character Kate returns, she was she leaves, as yes. we've come on to, was broadcast on the 21st of December, Christmas 1987. But were viewer figures higher or lower <laughs> than the 9 million people in 2.4? You watch 2.4 Children. Oh, no. Now, I need to take into consideration the the, the difference in, in years and... <sighs> yeah, it was a decade later. Yeah. I am going to guess higher. Dear John was higher? Dear John was higher in 1987. Well, you're right, but only just oh. 9.2 million people really? watched the finale, finale of, of Dear John. And when, when you consider 13 million people watch this one we're, we're deep diving today, yeah, that's quite a drop for the last God, one, isn't it? Isn't it? Isn't it? You one, think that it? that would be the one that, that got everybody back just for the just to, just to see the end? Apparently it was up against some stiff competition on ITV, which basically oh, lost okay. it at some points. Yeah. But no, it was 9.2 million people as opposed to the 9 million people. 
oh, okay. we watched the finale for 2.4 children. So, yeah, you need this one to win. Yep. Do you remember Brucey said, it's a bit Mother Goose, isn't it? <laughs> Never. Don't know, what, what was he no, doing? He just said the Generation Game, 1980s. It's a bit Mother Goose. No. Give us a twirl was one. What else is in this list? Print it, print it. <laughs> These are very, <laughs> very <laughs> loose, aren't they? This is from the sun, so print it, print it. <laughs> Final question for you. Ralph Bates, who, as we discussed, died young at just 51. Yes. In his professional career, he wrapped up 61 acting credits on IMDb. Right. On the, uh, on the small and large screen. Peter Denyer, who played Ralph, of course, also died young. Curse of dear John. Uh, he died at 62. Right. Bless him. But did he have more or less credits than Ralph Bates on IMDb? No, then. Mm, it's a bit mother goose, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which, according to the, to this list in front of me, is one of Brucey's catchphrases. The infamous mother goose catchphrase. Um, I am going to say he had less than Ralph Bates. You're right. I thought you'd go for more. You're right. Well done. He got 22 because mainly he was actually a stage performer yeah. and then, then a prolific playwright. He reckoned that he, he he teamed up with somebody and he wrote loads and loads and loads of pantomimes and he reckoned he was the most prolific playwright of the 80s and 90s because he had like more than 200 productions using his scripts each year. Is that right? Blimey. So... That's why he only has 22 INDB credits. I mean, he was in Police, Sir, Esmond and Larby yeah. comedy. And he makes like, he makes little sort of cameos in other sitcom appearances. I found one of him in On the Up. Oh, On the Up, yeah. But yes, mainly he was, mainly he was more to do with theatre, darling. Oh. So, so well done. You've Yay, won three, three out of four. four. Well done, me. <laughs> print it, print it. Which, again, is another catchphrase <laughs> of Bruce Forsyth, according to this list in front of me. <laughs> you going to print it, print it? I am. Well done. Didn't she do well? <laughs> That's that, then. Uh, enough crappy Bruce Forsyth impersonation. Should we get stuck into this episode of Dear John? Yes, let's get started. Dear John. <laughs> By the time you read this life, I'll be gone. Life goes on, right or wrong. Now it's all been said and done, dear John. Seems we've sung love's last song, dear John. So the opening of this episode sees us arriving at the um, the community centre that hosts the, the one-to-one club normally. But on this night, however, we arrive at the centre for the infamous disco that Louise was sort of plugging the previous week. Mm. And there's music banging out. Obviously, it's I think we mentioned last week about the, the Beatles music that wasn't allowed to be in the episode when it was reshown and when it went to dvd and to vhs but however you can hear you can hear culture club like banging out can't yeah. you when he walks in yeah i enjoyed that yeah so he's ar- he's arrived at the disco and john is looking um, a bit perturbed he doesn't know where he's supposed to be going i'd just follow the culture club music if i'd got there however we mm. soon find out there are three discos going on at this community center uh, on this evening god it must have been like rocking that place Disco Techs. Disco Tech, which is what John calls it. Yeah, Disco Tech. It always sounds far too, far more continental and kind of flash if people call it a Disco a Tech. Disco Tech, I think. yeah. Yeah. But John um, goes up to the desk and asks this, this security guard where he's supposed to go. The security guard just scoffs, really, and says, like, oh, I'm a man of his age, as if, like, just really <laughs> yeah. sort of scathing of John trying to go to, a, go to a disco, which is a shame. But apparently there are... 
um, there's the gay gala in the Oscar Wilde suite. This is like a real sort of sweeping generalisation into this. Yeah. The gay gala in the Oscar Wilde suite. There's grab a granny night in the main hall. And the divorced and desperate mob have got the green room. And I'm guessing that's where the one-to-one club are. The divorced and desperate. What a shame. I would think so. So that's where John realises where he's supposed to be. But the, the guard shouts after him, you're not gay or disabled, are you? And John says, no, I'm just a bit nervous. And then the security guard says, well, the council will give you a, lift, a free lift home if you're, if you're gay or disabled. Well, I can get that for the disabled, but why did why do gay people get a free lift home? Is this because it was an age of homophobia and they might get beaten was up Was it a safety, a safety issue, perhaps, which is, I don't know, I, I, I couldn't quite decide whether that was discriminatory. Discrimin- discriminatory. All right, Brucey. <laughs> or, or whether it was... Um, Actually, a, 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 a decent idea to keep people safe well, in that time. I'd turn if I got a free lift home. Well, there must, yeah, so it's obviously, and maybe that was like a pull for, for getting people to the disco in the Oscar Wilde suite, perhaps, knowing that they'd get a lift home. Yeah, well, it's either a safety thing or it's discriminatory. Yeah. But regardless, he's not willing to. No. To claim either. Either, no. Claim a foot in either camp. No, is he? he'd rather just be labelled as divorced and desperate. So as he heads towards the door to go into the um, the green room, he hears Louise has already got somebody and asking them about their sexual problems. She, he can hear it yeah. through the door already. So he knows what kind of night he's going to be in for. When he goes in, there's another song playing, isn't there? There's um, I O U by Freeze. All right. You know that one? A E A E I O U. I sometimes cry. I don't no? know. That. No, I don't. Well, I used to, really. No, I well, don't maybe know it's just that. my interpretation of it. I used to think it was called. I used to think the lyric was, A E A E I O U, a bunch of fives. <laughs> I love misheard lyrics. Like that guy in Faulty Towers. <laughs> He's got his dander up. Oh, I'll give you a bunch of fives. John heads in to the disco, which is quite sad, isn't it? Because there's not many people there. There's a couple dancing. Um, on like an imaginary dance floor and Louise is talking in depth in some kind of like theoretical detail really to, to some woman yeah about like relationship theory it's quite well researched though because this you know I mean it sounds like psychobabble but she was referencing ideas by Gestalt which are genuine yeah because I've come across them in my studies yeah so you know it makes me laugh that when she goes from like trying to poor people and trying to get like sexual details out of them to she, and she can turn really quickly to be quite well informed and and obviously someone that's well read and a bit deeper than we sort of first think perhaps. But then she flips back, doesn't she, when she says, "Well, but then again, a little bit of what you fancy does you good." Exactly, exactly. Yeah, she, she asked John. <laughs> she says that she's um she's talking to this lady about fondling and asked John for his opinion about fondling on the first date. And this lady that, that Louise is talking to disappears quite quickly. That's quite. I think she she's got a habit of making people feel quite uncomfortable quite quickly. I think as Louise. Well, uh, Sylvia, who is, Sylvia, is yes. the lady in question, and she becomes a sort of recurring character as time goes on yes. in this in this show. She's quite nervous anyway, isn't she? She's got that nervous laugh. Yeah. Nice to meet you, Sylvia. Hello. <laughs> Which is kind of annoying, but. I I quite warm to Sylvia. I had to sort of sympathise with her as a social awkward, socially awkward person, you know? Do you think the answer to the question, should you fondle on the first date, is yes or no? Oh, I think it, it's... Oh, I don't know. I think it's all down to the moment and whatever you're happy with. Yes, I agree. But I reckon in the 80s... Yeah, cons- Consent didn't seem to be an issue <laughs> then, yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. But John's a gentleman. I think, John would... Yeah, John's answer was very much... He is, a, he is a gentleman, I think, isn't he? He's very... Um, I think he's quite thoughtful. I think this episode in particular shows him as being quite a thoughtful character. Yeah, I mean, if it had been Kirk. God, yeah. Different answer, different God, answer. yeah. Mrs Arnott arrives. She's been accidentally sent to the Grab, grab a Granny Disco... Uh, so she's yeah. all a bit flustered, but she, um, John gets them, gets them a drink, gets a drink for uh, Mrs. Arnott and for Louise, and then Kirk turns up dancing like crazy on the dance floor. Oh dear! Mm. In his um, Saturday Night Fever uniform, Kate 
then arrives and and she thinks that the disco is just like a cattle market. It does make me wonder why she turns up to things because she already seems to have that really negative mindset of what it's going to be like. She's a bit of a moaning cow, really, isn't she? She's she isn't she? Sour face on her, and she's always got a complaint about something or other, and she's always quick to like snipe. Yeah. Back at John. Yeah. Yeah. She gets better though, I think. Tiger. <laughs> John thinks that Kate isn't enjoying it because she's frigid, <laughs> which she admitted the previous week, so that could be the problem. She's not having a good time because she's frigid. He's trying to be helpful, though, isn't he? He's not, he's, he he's not trying to be tactless. He's almost, he's almost trying to um, give her answers. I think sometimes, I, I don't know if you do this, but when, when someone's moaning about something or trying to tell me something, I find it better if I say, do you want me to listen or do you want help with this problem? That's very direct. Yeah. Is it something you want to just offload or do you want a solution? Because I think there's a difference in there between when you're in in a, a conversation like that, there's a different different way to approach it. But I think you need to know from that person what they want. Well, that's true because men traditionally always want to fix. Problem solving. And sometimes it's just not what you're looking for. Men are like, well, you should do this, men. You should do that. I mean, not all men, yeah. but generally that, that is a generalisation for a reason. And sometimes people just want to unload. So maybe that's what's going on here. Yeah. John reassures her that no one's going to mention it again at the one-to-one club. Hmm. He respects her honesty and um, he likes her too much for, for it to, to, to be, continue being a problem. Um, and he, tr- he tries to really make her feel better. Gets her a drink and, he, and he, he sorts her out to gin and tonic. At which point Kirk comes over with his jacket over his shoulder and calls her frigid Bridget. <laughs> She's just horrible. I thought, I'd written down he called her Scridged Frigid. I thought it was Frigid Bridget, as in Bridget. Yeah, I, I wrote down that would have worked better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it was. I think that I think it was. Oh, okay. I think it was. I was going to ask you what the hell Scridged meant. <laughs> Gin and tonic, please. Hey, it's Frigid Frigid. <laughs> After John making her feel better, he just goes and puts his, um, his foot in it again, and to which, to which Kate does say, drop dead cretin. Yeah. Um, and and he he sort of gaslights her a little bit with "Can't you take a joke?" But her reply to that really made me laugh because she said, "Can't you take an overdose?" Which I know is not a funny yeah. issue, but it's um, in in that context, it really made me it made me it made me laugh how quick she was. Kirk thinks that Ralph's upset. Um, he'd spoken to him and he was a bit concerned because Ralph had talked about ending it all, which is a bit of a worry. Mm. But the guys from the one to one club, um, this 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 made me. Um, I thought this was, this was quite heartwarming. I know they get together for the one to one club, but how they all sort of rallied really quickly to go and find out what the problem was. Because Kate gets the car, and Kate and John are quite worried. Kirk's not so worried. He just wants to have a dance. I think he shouts "Let's boogie" at this point to a woman. Let's oh. boogie. Um, but they go around and they want to make sure that their new friend is okay, which I thought was quite admirable and lovely. Yes. John and Kate, are, they're banging on the door and, and trying to sort of alert Ralph to the fact that they're there. And he comes to the door, but he's, he's really upset and he's crying. And he's, yeah. he's, he's in a really sort of bad way. Although, I have to say, grim as his flat is, it's not as bad as John's. No, it's not. It's not as bad as the, as the bed set, is it? No, at least he's got that going for him. I know he has a good moan now about the way his life's going, but imagine if he'd been in John's bed set with... Mrs. Lewinsky. Oh, God. Yeah. Step too far, maybe. He offers them tea, but they just want to help him. They're just there to help. And this is where, the, the obviously, the title of the episode comes into play here. Uh, Ralph tells them about the family curse. Ralph's grandfather was part of the team, apparently, that discovered the tomb of Tutankhamun. And there was a curse inside on the wall in hieroglyphics. He'd left the temple and his grandfather had got cut off from the rest of the group for five days in the desert. And on the sixth day, he'd found an oasis. And Kate says, well, that's, that's, that's awful, but it's not a curse, really, is it? And he says, well, he fell in and drowned. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a big discussion here over what's bad luck and what's just what you can put down to being a, a, a curse. Yeah, well, he says that his dad had bad luck, and they, and he said, "Well, how?" And he said, "Well, he had me." Yeah, I thought, oh, I know. Poor Ralph. Poor Ralph. Ralph's net, he's been made unemployed, but they say, "Well, there's four million people and unemployed, and they don't blame they don't blame it on King Tutankhamun." No, true. Which I thought was quite funny. 
It was Maggie instead. It was Maggie. It certainly was. And But then we get to the crux of the matter here of what's actually to do with Ralph. And it's that Terry's died, his best friend, who lived with Ralph and he died of, of a condition called red leg. And so that so Kate and John are quite concerned here that, that, that Ralph's lost his best friend. But they find out when Ralph pulls out a matchbox that Terry is a terrapin. Did you get the sense that they thought maybe he he was um, living a sort of secret in the closet gay life with this Terry at first? Do you know what? I didn't pick up on that, but now you said that, perhaps that, yeah, perhaps they did. Looked like the exchange looks, but maybe I imagined it. Mm. But Terry, yeah, Terry was a, the last of the um, the terrapins that Ralph had bred, um, so he, he was he was gutted. He was gutted. So all these things, his job, his best friend. Oh, and his electric razor's broken as well. Yeah, icing on the cake. Oh, bless him. So yeah. Kate comforts him um, and she gives him a kiss on the cheek. John says, well, you, <laughs> can't you just use a normal razor? And Ralph says, no, I've got this skin complaint, to which <laughs> Kate just like wipes her face with her hands. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, what Aww. has he got? Oh, bless him. Any sexual problems? John has a bit of a monologue here about how how difficult his life has been recently. And he says, like, three years ago, I had a happy family life. And then I got a letter telling me that my wife and my home and my child were were gone. And I don't think it's a curse. But then he does this Mm. really sort of... It's brilliant acting, this, like, double take of, like, do I? Do I, do I actually think it's yeah. a curse? I've not really thought about it. Maybe it is. It's like an afterthought, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm. But it's, a, it's really well acted. The way he does it, he's, he's brilliant. Terry's corpse, I should say at this point, is, is in a box of swan vestas, isn't it? It is. It's in like one of them um, quite like large match, match boxes, isn't it? Ralph talks then about his caravan that he had by the coast. He'd been so proud of it, this, this caravan that he had. Um, and a letter had arrived about the insurance and he'd forgot to pay it. But then... Yobs had pushed this this caravan down the embankment and it had been a write-off. Mm. And John says, well, that's just vandalism. That's just one of them things that happens. And Kate says, yeah, I, I can totally... I, I, she, she was really trying to sort of empathise by saying that she'd had this car, it was a pride and joy, and she'd looked after it and washed it and cleaned it, and it was stolen. And that's the same thing. It's the, That's the same thing. It's just, it's just one of them things. And Ralph says, yeah, but... You weren't sitting in it, were you? <laughs> so I can just picture poor Ralph rolling down this embankment in his in his caravan. What a shame. Well, this is a great example of, of the way John Sullivan will get several little additional bits of information revealed in the gag yes. to, to stretch it out to four or five punchlines. Yes. Because not only was it rolled out in the hill, it turns out Ralph was in it, and then it turns out he was in the toilet. Yeah. And he was upside down, trapped in the toilet for days. For days, yeah, for to, like two yeah. days. And then even when they came to um, to the fire brigade came to, to to sort him out. Oh, he was tapping out Mount Morse code as well, SOS Morse code. Yeah. He was tapping out on the wall. And when the fire brigade got there, they laughed at him. Oh. So he isn't having good luck, is he? He's not. All? He's having a real bad time of it. I like, I like the fact, though, that he says, I'll be honest... I'm a bit fed up. Oh, <laughs> Such an understatement, he is, isn't it? You yeah, thought he was going to say something much more dramatic. Um, Kate says it can only get better because it can't get any worse. At which point, Kurt walks in, <laughs> which for her <laughs> is like the worst possible thing. They said, have you got in? And he, he said, oh, the front door was wide open. Um, I got thrown out of the disco because I, men- I mentioned to some bloke that his chick looked like a smurf. <laughs> Don't know what's that. But I don't know what kind of state she must have been in if he thought that she looked like a Smurf. Was she? Was she? I don't know. Do I? I can just think of that character in Car Share now that was dressed as a Smurf. As a Smurf, yeah. Yeah. But Kirk is so insensitive, isn't he? Going, oh, makes you wonder if life's worth living, I eh? No. Oh. I reckon you're cursed, Ralphie. <laughs> After all, they've been trying to talk him out of it, and then yeah, Kirk just comes in with a big wrecking ball, doesn't he? Ralph gets Kirk a lager. And, and Kate and John are, are worried that Ralph's going to cut his wrists in the kitchen because there's knives in there. Mm. So um, John decides that he's going to spend the night on the sofa at Ralph's house to take care of him. John then tells Kirk about Terry. And, and Kirk, actually, Kirk's quite confused here about who Terry is. So, yeah, maybe you're yeah, right. Yeah. John has to explain that it's his friend and that it's his pet. John's, he's, John's really empathic um, about about Terry. Ralph's got really <laughs> Ralph's got really strong feelings about his, his his pet. So Kirk sort of steps up and says, "Well, I want to help. So I'll I'll bury 
Terry. That'll be my job. Yeah, because he says, I'm not an empty shell. He really he pleads to, to be allowed to help. And I think that is the, the redeeming side of Kurt because he does care. He he's does. just awful at He's awful at putting it into practice. Yeah, he wants to be part of it and he wants to help his friend. But then he does this really daft thing where he shakes the box with the with the terrapin in it. <laughs> oh. Where he says, that's the kind of guy I am, as he shakes the box. Yeah. On that subject, on that catchphrase, it was brought to my attention the other day that after Dear John ended, mm. several years later when Fools and Horses was still running, John Sullivan crowbarred that catchphrase back in to Fools and Horses as something Del Boy says. All right. He starts saying it in, I say the later years, but like in, into the 90s, Del Boy suddenly starts saying that every now and again. That's the kind of That's guy I am. That's the kind of guy I am. I, do you know what? I can, Different I can, delivery. I can hear Del Boy saying it. Mm. Yeah. Different delivery than, than Peter Blake. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a good little saying, isn't it? It to is. To have one of your characters repeatedly come back to. And it's a great setup as well for the next bit because John says to him, well, inside that flash crass, crass exterior, there's a really nice guy struggling to get out, mm. to which then he hears the toilet flush <laughs> and they know what's happened to, to poor Terry the Terrapin. Um, and they're really shocked, John and Kate. They shouldn't be, but they no, are. No, it was pretty much, you could see it happening, couldn't you? It's a Terrapin. Ralph's had him since he was a child. He kept it in that aquarium and his death... On top of everything else, has upset him rather badly. So why is he keeping the body in the flat? I mean, that's hardly likely to cheer him up, is he? Well, he thought of getting rid of it, or burying it outside in the garden or something, but he hasn't managed to get around to it. We'll have to do it for him. Yeah, it looks like it. I'll do it. You? No. And thanks for the offer, Kurt, but I'll do it. Oh, wait a minute. Well, Tiger's looking after Ralphie in the kitchen, right? Hmm? You're going to stay here all night, keep an eye on him, yeah? Hmm? So let me do something for him. Like the thing that I helped in some way. <laughs> you? I'm not an empty shell. Inside here lives a person. Oh, let me do something for him. Please. <laughs> this is nice of you, Kirk. That's the sort of guy I am. We're then at the next morning, and there's a bit of a change in, in pace, really, because Ralph's up and he's bustling about, he's been shopping... John John looks like he he's the one that's had the sort of like bad time of it. He's asleep on the couch with the like a candlewick bed spread over him, looking a bit bedraggled, isn't it, in his shirt and Yeah. He's very dishevelled. But maybe he's just affected by Ralph's insufferably chipper mood because Ralph's gone full Tom Good here, hasn't he? He has. He might as well be whistling. He's he's so full of the joys of spring. He is. I, those type of people are exhausting first thing in the morning, aren't they? He's had a, he's had a, he's had a good time of it though. He seems a lot brighter, um, and he gets John a brew, and he he does seem like hundred percent happier. He, he said, "I want what's what's the change? What's happened?" And Ralph says, "I've got something that millions of people don't have," and John dubiously puts his brew down, like, "Oh my god, what's he going to say?" Yeah, and Ralph's just happy about having friends, which I think is lovely. What a nice way to feel when you've been feeling so dreadful, because the, the the guys from the one to one club have obviously made such a big fuss about him and, and wanted to make sure he's all right. And it's paid off because it's really cheered Ralph up. Mm. The doorbell goes and John answers it and it's Kirk, who's again, like a sledgehammer, you look like a heap of garbage, he says to, to poor John, who spent the night on the couch. <laughs> he says, don't even breathe in my direction. John explains that Ralph's feeling better. And Kirk says, well, he'll feel even better when he knows what Kirk he's done for him. Mm. And John's quite dubious about this because he's, you know, he he doesn't know what Kirk's done in order to um to cheer up Ralph. But he says to him, "Have you had the terrapin mounted on a medallion?" <laughs> oh, I kind of almost wish he had. That would have been a great visual gag. I know, just to see it. Kirk says to Ralph, "Close your eyes and hold your hand out." And Ralph says, "Um, I'd rather not." He says, "Last time I did that." Someone stole my watch. He really does have a bad time of it, I think, Ralph. I'm beginning to believe in the curse. Yeah, it's uh, he's not wrong. So the gift, when, when Ralph opens it, is John's quite relieved to see that it's a shaver. He's bought he's bought Ralph a shaver because his shaver broke as well. And Ralph's quite mm. overwhelmed, isn't he? He's, um, he's, he's, yeah, he's moved to tears, he isn't he? He is, he is. Kirk sends him in the kitchen for some cocoa. He wants a bottle of cocoa pops. And John says, you're full of surprises to Kirk. Kirk then announces that he's going to head into the kitchen and cook an omelette for after the Cocoa Pops. 
I love this though when he walks in and his first thing he says is bloody hell Ralphie what a dreadful kitchen <laughs> he's, just, he's just he's the kind of person you think oh god what a what a dick but actually I, I, he's, he's, I think he's someone that you would just get used to you would just get on with and get used to yeah the, we all have people like that in our lives who are tactless but have a, a good hearted you yeah know? you make allowances because they're good people a little goes a long way so yes. we make sure we only see them when we want to see them yeah John tries the shaver which is a bit cheeky that I think he, he got the shaver out mm. to um, have, have a go with and it doesn't seem to be to be working or cutting um, so he, he tries to take the blade apart but the top bit flies off into the terrapin tank and explodes mm. Oh, so he unplugs it and dries it on his shirt, and and then he's like he's like panicking at this stage. He's he's the doorbell goes and he says, "I'll I'll get it," but he's he's really panicking. Louise and Kate are at the door and ask, "How's everything?" And John just says, "What do you mean?" <laughs> he's he's yeah, like very really, defensive, isn't he's he? He's obviously been he has the air of someone that's been walked in on. Let's just put it that way. Mm. Kate asks if Ralph's okay, and Ralph Ralph then says, "Well." My cooker's on the blink and my kettle's on the blink and, and John says maybe it's a, a blown fuse knowing what's just happened with the um, the shaver in the terrapin tank. Louise and Kate have another surprise for Ralph to cheer him up and they say that they're going to take him to the pet shop to get a new terrapin, which is lovely. Mm. Ralph says, it's all right, there's no need to do that because I've already been this morning and got myself some more. Mm. So lo and behold, the terrapin tank is full of terrapins and that have just been electrocuted by John. With the shaver. Yeah, John's John's face when he sees that though. Oh no. He, I mean he's, he is brilliant in this episode he is. when he sees that that's happened and he's like, Oh my god, what have I done? But thankfully Ralph's left the room as soon as he said that, so he doesn't see the floating terrapins, does he? No. He's gone straight back into the kitchen for some reason. He's gone for some sparkling wine to celebrate yes, the that's new right, t- yeah, to celebrate yeah. the new terrapins. Oh no. Um he wants to toast his friends because he's he's so happy with, with life. And John looks, he looks quite sheepish. He does, but it's quite a nice moment with these sort of, um, I was going to say five new friends. Is it five? Yeah, it's five of them there, isn't it? It's just Mrs. Arnott who's not there. Who's not there, yeah. They, they're all sort of bonding as friends and, you know, and Kirk says something about, you know, the most important things of life are, are looking back on times you've had with friends and everything. Absolutely. Because he says to Louise, doesn't he, you, you bet you've been a bit of a wild cat. Yeah. Oh God. And, but do you know what? She she could have really gone to town on that. You think that she would have like you know knowing what she's like and what she likes to chat about. She could have yeah. gone to town, but she doesn't really, does she? She doesn't really divulge much. She's she's very restrained, but then she has a little moment where she goes yes and sort of looks into the middle distance. <laughs> uh, Kirk shares a memory of a time when he spent a, a really good time with some friends. He says one of his favourite times was when he was really drunk at the seaside with his mates and they saw a caravan on the seafront and then it just it just ends but we know that Kirk was involved in vandalising and kicking Ralph's caravan down the ravine yeah <laughs> which is great what a, what an arc for a joke as well the fact that it goes literally the whole episode waiting for the punchline yeah and it was a, yeah then the credits roll but it's quite it's quite a nice ending to the to the episode I, you still feel like they've they've moved on as a friendship group and you can see that the relationships are developing between them and and the care and concern they've got for each other exactly i i was just glad that ralph was out of the room a not to see the dead terrapins yeah. and b not to realize that his new friend was the one who who, who knocked his caravan who down tipped his caravan oh, no. yeah i i hope somehow they distracted ralph while they went and got some more terrapins yeah. Because he's so sweet, isn't he? Yeah. He's a bit like the Manuel character that we in, in Faulty Towers that you just, Very much. You just want to give him a hug and look after him. Yeah, make sure he's okay. I bet they did. I bet Kate and Louise went and got new terrapins and replaced the second dead terrapin. Seems we've sung love's last song, dear John. There was a lot of uh, strong performances from the characters in terms of their reactions to Ralph's depression here yes. and I think they, they could all be nominees for MVP but did you have one who stood out? I think in this episode I'm going to say Kirk in this episode hmm. despite the fact that we find out that he, he knocked the caravan down um, the embankment with Ralph in it in the past but I think the what he showed in this episode the character development as someone that, that has the potential to be caring and to want to be nice despite the fact that he puts his foot in it occasionally. 
Mm. You, you see sort of a, a peek behind the curtain at, at Kirk, I think. I'm going to agree with you on that. Yeah. I, I'm very tempted to give it to John, John again because yeah. Ralph, Bates, Ralph Bates is fantastic. Mm. I just think he's such a good actor, such an underrated actor. But I agree with you. It moved Kirk on from being just an arsehole. Yes, it did. To being a arsehole with a heart. I mean, that credit to the writing for that, but his delivery of it, mm. while still maintaining arsehole behaviour, like immediately walking into the kitchen going, what a dreadful kitchen. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. just love that bit. I, yeah. I agree with you. I, th- I thought he was very good, Peter Blake, in this. Yeah. Mm. A lot of John's timing um, and timing of his of, of certain lines and and expression, I think, was was brilliant in in this episode and sort of pushed that character up in my estimation as well. Yeah. Despite the fact that he's a, he's the lead character, it is all it all sort of revolves around around John, but I just think he, in this episode in particular, just showed. His 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 ability to 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 play to play the character and to play it out really really well. And he showed his he showed his good egginess. He did. As we discussed last week. Yep. Yeah. He is a good egg. I think even though Ralph uh, Ralph even though Kirk is obnoxious a lot of the time, I think he will win other MVPs just for some of the lines that he has. I think so. For Peter Blake's performances. And you know, I like a a, a story arc, a character arc. I like a, I like I like growth in my characters. So yeah, yeah I can see yeah. he. Yeah, it'll 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 play out strongly, I think. Um, in he's in, a dark horse I in the MVP states, mm, mm. and there's more to come. I was a bit remiss again, Al. I didn't spot any bric a brac this week, other than the, the generic '80s school hall disco, which I thought was yeah. very reminiscent, but not really anything that I could qualify as bric a brac. Did you get anything? Um, there was a couple of things that oh, I don't know. Not really bric a brac. They have a bit of a feel of Mrs. Hall's face. These two things. Okay. The first one was the candle wick bread bedspread that John was wrapped in, just because I remember in the eighties, either like being, if you if you if you stopped at your nana's and you were a bit cold, they threw a candle wick bedspread on you. Yeah. Or if you went to the caravan, you, you had a candle wick bedspread thrown over you just to keep you a bit warmer. While you're in the toilet upside down. <laughs> when you when you when you tapping out SOSs on the on the wall for two days. You've got a candle with bedspread. So for me, they are very reminiscent of, of that time period. Terrapins as well. Terrapins remind me of the 80s because of yep. uh, uh, Rocky. Rocky uh, Rocky Balboa had terrapins. Uh-huh. He had pet terrapins, Cuff and Link. So when I think about terrapins, I think about that decade. I don't know why, but that, that's where I, where I go. So for me, also bric-a-brac. Right, okay. And the the razor, the, the the shaver as well. I've just got it. Yeah, I know. I know there's plug-in shavers now, but that that single bar, like metal strip that you your dad had, and like rubbed them all over it, like all over his face. I'm a dinosaur when it comes to that stuff, though, because I, I've literally just on Christmas Day, which we're filming this, we're we're recording this three days after Christmas Day. I've literally just received my first electric razor of my life at the age of forty-four. Really? Yeah, I've just got one. I've never had one before because I have very fine facial hair and I, I always think it won't cut it. Like I'd used my dad's years ago and yeah. it just didn't do anything. So I consulted the Oracle. Yeah. I spoke to your husband and said, what do I need? Okay, right, yeah. Ralph's looked like something you'd see in the in the Argos catalogue, like circa 1983. And in fact, it probably was. It probably was, indeed. Because this was 1986, and I can't see Kirk buying a brand new model. No, no. Well, the fact that the fact it didn't work <laughs> should have should have like pointed towards the fact that it wasn't brand new, perhaps. So I imagine that Fashion Corner's got some interesting things to talk about from the from the school hall disco. Al, shall we have a trip over there? Let's go. Whatever happened to those clothes we It seems we never wear those clothes no more. Fashion corner. When we first meet Louise at the the disco, she's dressed in a, a Cadbury purple brocade style jacket with three quarter length sleeves and shoulder pads. Very reminiscent of of your mum at a, at a party in the eighties, definitely. It was like pur- like purple, but with like a silvery detail on it. John is dressed in like a grey blue suit with blue shirt and tie. The suit 
looks quite classy. It's it's got like a sheen to it, but not 1980s shiny, not like Miami Vice shiny. Mm. Just got like a nice classy sheen to it. And when I see John in a in a in a suit like that, I don't know. I can imagine he's only got like one suit that he wears for like every occasion, whether it's work or. It's practically destitute, isn't he? So yeah. Wouldn't surprise it's me. Probably his only suit, isn't it? Mrs. Arnott is in like a biscuit-coloured hat and a matching teal blouse and skirt. She's she's like proper old lady fashion, isn't she? She's like she's got like the old lady style. Well, that's why she got directed to the Grab a Granny night, even though she's. I know. The actress was fifty-two at this point. Oh. There's like an embroidered detail on the collar and the cuffs of the blouse, which is like a very sort of older lady thing in the 80s. Everybody, mm. anyone that was like over, I don't know, this is going to sound awful, but anyone that was like over 50 around that time looked old. They looked like, whether it was like the hair, they had the hair like sort of set with like rollers and they just looked older. Mm. No, it's true. My grandparents looked old at, like in the 60s and my dad's like nearly 80 now and he, he doesn't look old at all. My grandparents very similar. Whether it was the way they dressed, or yeah. their hair, or even just like weathered faces in some Absolutely, cases yeah, yeah. from working on the docks, yeah. you know. Kate arrives in a blue jacket with matching high-waisted loose trousers, which I think they were called parachute pants in the eighties, like kind of like MC Hammer style, saggy, mm. saggy crotch <laughs> trousers. I'm sure, that's not how they were sold. Yeah. Hello, a marketing spiel, isn't it? CNA. <laughs> now with new saggy improved crotch. saggy crotch. <laughs> she has a red fitted top underneath with a belt and some black beads. She looked quite cool, I think. She's, got, she's quite stylish, Kate. Very blue. Uh, Kirk's dressed in his usual Saturday Night Fever looking uniform until the following morning when he arrives at Ralph's and he's in like a grey jacket with a patterned shirt underneath. Like a casual Kirk. I thought. Still with leather pants, though. Still with leather pants, but more of a, of a casual look about him, I thought. Ralph has a really fetching, patterned, knitted tank top on when, when we go around to his house and we see him. I think it might be the following morning, actually, and he's, he's got, like, his usual shirt and tie underneath, but the, the tank top's got, like, a re- like really sort of delicate details on it of, of, like, tulips and there's, like, yellow chevrons in the pattern. And it's, I think it's quite a lovely tank top. Do you think this is his cheerful tank top? That it did look cheerful. That up. I thought it was, yeah, a cheerful tank top. So maybe that's what he puts on when he's happy. Would have been nice if there'd been some terrapins <gasps> on it. Knitted, knitted terrapin. That would have been very sweet, wouldn't it? It would. Terrapin detail. Oh. So yeah, that's it for, for Fashion Corner this week. Plenty though, plenty on, 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 on display. So that's episode three. And we're halfway through series one already. My goodness. Nearly. Do you know what next week's episode is called, Al? Is it the party? <laughs> I believe it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not reveal why we're laughing at that. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, next week's episode is the party. They go to um, one of the other, I think it's the Monday night or the Wednesday night group. Oh, rival, rival group. Yeah, and hilarity ensues. Of course it does. With t- tinged with pathos, as is, as is the way. Oh, is Kirk just going to going to try and cop off with our Monday night group? I don't know. Probably. Well, he looked like he was already doing that at the disco, didn't it? Yeah. So we'll we'll deep dive that one for you next week. If you're enjoying what we're doing, you can always follow us at Saddle Podcast on Twitter and Instagram, where we post rare photos and videos on Dear John, Faulty Towers, and the Good Life, and more. We have a Facebook page that you can find by searching Saddle Podcast and we also have a growing Facebook group that you can join and contribute to with discussion or memes, rarities or whatever else you find. Subscribe to our newsletter by visiting our website at saddle.club where you can also get more information about us, read the blog posts, share us a coffee and listen to episodes if you don't do podcast apps. You can also watch the original episodes that we discuss on our episode notes page or take our super tricky Good Life and Faulty Towers quizzes. Get in touch. Email us at saddlepodcast at gmail.com and subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. That would be appreciated. Yeah, we do that. We do like a nice review. Pampers our egos now and again to have a nice little review. As we're recording this just after Christmas... I mean, I, I probably know what the answer is, but what was your very, very favourite Christmas episode of any sitcom ever? Mm. There was one of where Arthur Lowe played his his own brother, Captain Mannering's brother, in Dad's yes. Army. 
That was a Christmas one, wasn't it? And there was uh, the Dear John Christmas special where he spends a Christmas with Mrs. Lemensky is also really nice, which is the last one we'll ever cover. Yeah. But I'm going to guess that your favourite is The Good Life, isn't it? It is, it is. It's the one where <laughs> the Christmas doesn't arrive from um, from Harrods and they have yeah. to wear the paper hats. It, 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 it always is, and I could watch it over and over again. The porridge one's quite good, though. Do you remember the porridge one? I don't think I do. Oh, well, let's save that because I think even though there's not a lot of fashion on display, we may end up circling around to porridge yeah. at some point. I can always swap yeah. fashion corner for, for for some other specific element of the show, perhaps. <laughs> there's not a lot of bric-a-brac in, in Slade Prison either, to be honest. <laughs> so we'll see you next week for Series 1, Episode 4, The Party. I'll see thee. We'll see you then. Dear John Dear John By the time Love's last song, dear John.